morning. My name is Barbara Goldentire, and I am the Environmental Education Manager at the Cape Fear Botanical Gardens. Thank you for joining us today for this week's virtual class. And we are learning about the animal kingdom and taxonomy, which is a really big word. It might be a little tiny bit intimidating, but it's really super fun and super easy. And we'll teach you some super fun ways to make your own taxonomies at home, including ways that you can use Pokemon or Harry Potter creatures or Mario characters, whatever kind of fun uh, different creatures you enjoy learning about. So taxonomy is a word that just means the branch of science that involves classifying things. It's just about dividing things into groups and looking at what makes them similar or different, especially when the thing we're talking about is animals. So you might have seen things that look like this at maybe a museum or in a book or in school if you were learning about that. It might tell you about different groups of animals and which ones are related and which are not. So taxonomy tells us uh, which animals are reptiles and which are not. It tells us what the closest relatives of our house cat are. It tells us about the history of evolution and it tells us about how different organisms might be related or not. One thing to know about taxonomy is that it has changed a lot over time. Scientists made a ton of mistakes in the past and they just had really different ways of thinking about the world. So I actually have a taxonomy over there from Aristotle and you'll see on that that they included non-living things in their taxonomy, that they don't have anything really small. They didn't have microscopes back there, so they don't have bacteria, they don't have viruses, they don't have anything like that on their tree of life. And they only use a few really big groups, and they're organized very much going straight up in a line. And that's because they kind of thought of the world as moving up toward God. But they didn't they also put humans in that hierarchy and compared to animals and plants, and it was really a hierarchy towards being supernatural. But today, scientists use DNA to make different kinds of taxonomies. So the most common kind of taxonomy that you would see today is actually like this one up here. I'll let you get close up on that. And you can see that there's two big categories on there, bacteria and archaea. And those are actually all single-celled life, tiny little things. So things that are so small, we can't even see them. And then, way down here, that's animals, animalia. They're just on that one little corner way down there. So that really reflects much better all the different kinds of life that are in the world and how so much of the life that is in the world is actually really tiny things that we don't think about a lot. You also notice that that one is more like a half circle instead of a tree that goes straight up. It's not so much of a line. And it all branches off from one point down here. That's the common ancestor. Down there, if we knew what it was, we could put the very first life on Earth at the very bottom. And everything else would branch off from that. But that's not the only kind of taxonomy that people can make. You can classify animals by all kinds of things, by color, by size, by shape, by where they live, all kinds of ways. So here's a couple other ones that are actually taxonomies that scientists could use. This one separates animals by where they live in the ocean. Some live in the area where sunlight reaches, and you have a lot of animals that can eat different kinds of plants or, or algae in the ocean, and some live in the deeper regions all the way to where no light can reach at all. And that's where you might get a lot of animals that can actually bioluminesce or glow and produce their own light. So it's kind of cool to think about taxonomies like that. You can also make a taxonomy of organisms based on different abilities that they have. So this group, Nekton, are organisms capable of swimming against a current. And that matters a lot for animals that live in the water. So it means they can move around based on where they want to go instead of just drifting in the water or sitting on the bottom. Before they had DNA evidence, the main thing that scientists used to create taxonomies was the kind of characteristics of animals. And they had to piece it together like a puzzle to tell what characteristics might mean that animals were grouped together. So here's one that some people did using five different types of birds. They have a pelican, a goldfinch, a cardinal, a robin, and a blue jay. Maybe some birds that you might be familiar with. Yep, an Atlantic canary finch, not a goldfinch. Sorry about that. And you can 
see, they split the pelican off first. That's because they're the most different. They're really made for living in the water, webbed feet, and lay big eggs. And then up here, they put the cardinal and the finch together because they knew that both of those like to eat seeds and insects. So that's a little different. As we go up a little more, they split the robin off. And finally, they split the blue jay off. And so breaking off until we get to just one organism by itself. And that's the bottom of the tree. So let's go ahead and make our own taxonomy, our first one. Here we have a lot of different animals. They're not all related by something. I didn't pick them for any special reason. This is just what we kind of had in the drawer. A bunch of plastic animals that we happen to have at the garden. And you can do something like this with animals that you have at home. Whatever stuffed animals you have or whatever kind of toy animals or Legos critters that you have, you can do at home. So there are a lot of ways that I can make a taxonomy. If you're making one at home, your first thought might be to group them by size. These are all kind of small. Now, these guys are big, right? All right. But maybe that's not wrong, but maybe I want to think about it a little differently. Maybe something that's a little more useful. Because I also know that even though there might be a similar size, the flamingo and the fairy don't have a lot else in common. <laughs> so maybe I want to think about something a little bit different. I could try and go by color, but then I get this fairy and this dinosaur together because they're both sort of green. That's not wrong, but it's also not the most useful. So let's say I think about some features of the animals. Well, I know that all these have a tail and four legs. And these guys have a tail and four legs. And these guys have six legs. So I'll start putting them over there. And then I have some with feathers. So maybe I'll start putting them over there. You might have noticed that I've got all our dinosaurs grouped together. If you know something from real taxonomy, like these are all dinosaurs, you can use that too. Here we go. This one has wings. I know it's not a real dinosaur, but I know it was alive then. So I'll put it kind of near the dinosaurs, but not quite with them. Here's all my insects. And this one, well, it doesn't have anything to go with right now. So it'll be kind of on its own. Now, if I want to look at my insect group, I can also notice other things. Like, these ones I can see their wings. And these ones, I know their wings are under that shell case. So maybe I put those together and these other ones separately. And then these have big wings. And this has wings and antenna, but it looks a little different shaped wings. So I'll put it a little separately. And then these ones, I don't really see their wings either, but they're long and thin with really long legs that go up and down. So I'll put them kind of close. There we go. I've got my insects kind of divided. Now, maybe I know the dinosaurs developed from reptiles. So I go reptiles, and dinosaurs, and then birds. But also, from around the time of the dinosaurs, we're going to start to branch off to mammals. And eventually, we'll get our hippo, and then uh, further along, our fairy. So, one thing that you can notice when you're doing something like this is that sometimes a feature really distinguishes animals. Everything that has a feather is a bird. But sometimes it doesn't. Like, bats have wings, but they're not birds. And this guy has wings, but the pterodactyl, it's not a bird either. <laughs> so sometimes a feature is really defining in a taxonomy, and sometimes it isn't. And that's where scientists used to have to figure out this puzzle. But at home, what you get to do is kind of make it up and see what seems like an important feature to you. Whether it's that that Pokemon can make electric lightning bolts, or that that dragon can breathe fire, or maybe just that this animal has four legs, whichever one seems important. So, let's go back to talk for just a minute about how you split up down to one animal. What you can see there is a taxonomy that's narrowing down to get you the species of just one species. It's actually a grizzly bear here. So, at each level of getting narrower down, scientists have a special name for that level of classification. So this is a taxonomy of a grizzly bear, and we start out with the grizzly bear, a black bear, a panda, a fox, and actually a coral snake and a sea star in there too, animals that don't have a lot in common. Then we get narrower, we get rid of the sea star, 
Now we're just looking at really animals, maybe animals that have backbones. We're in the kingdom, animalia, only animals. Then we move into the phylum and we get rid of that snake. We're looking only at chordata. And then we're only looking at mammals. So now we've just got the three bears and the fox because those are all mammals. They all have fur and they're all warm blooded. And then we move into carnivora and we're only looking at animals that can eat meat. And then we look, although they have a panda on there, but we won't talk too much about that. Uh, <laughs> we've got family Ursidae, and we're only looking at these two bears that are in the same fam genus. And then finally, we've got the species, and that's our grizzly bear on the bottom. The genus and the species together are used to make the scientific name of an animal. So you can see it says Ursus arctus, and that's for grizzly bear, and that's the genus Ursus plus their species name, Arctus, for the grizzly bear. To help you remember the order of all those classifications, you can remember King Philip catches only frogs going south. I like that acronym, but there's a lot of them that you can use. So King Philip catches only frogs going south. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. But if you don't remember that, you don't really need it to create <laughs> taxonomy. And a lot of times, we don't learn that until high school, so it's okay if you're not learning that right now. One of the really fun things about taxonomies is that they help us to think about what features in animals are important and how animals might have developed, how they might have evolved to be a certain way. So I think it's really fun to do this with mythical creatures because in a way, they evolved a little bit like animals over time as people develop different stories in different parts of the world, you got different types of mythical creatures. So I made a little taxonomy using dragon pictures. These are pictures I just gathered from the internet. So you might recognize Spyro and some Chinese dragons. I certainly don't claim credit for creating any of these dragon art. They're just some <laughs> random pictures that different artists created on the internet. But I noticed that these two pictures of dragons, they both have a long body, they both have four legs, and they both have whiskers and a lot of kind of hair around their face and some spines down their back. So they have a lot in common. So I'm pretty sure they're in a similar group. So I put them together on the bottom. And then I split off the dragons that continued to have some of those facial features and a long body into one group. And then I went the other way as they started to get more of what is the European facial features that we might recognize on different kinds of dragons. So I put the ones that have just a few legs in between. Maybe they lost a few legs, but they still have the long, thin body, kind of like the Chinese dragon. And it starts to get horns like Spyro does. So I think maybe those are connected. And you can see way up at the top, we have one that lost its wings again. So we go from no wings to wings to no wings again. And that can actually happen in nature too. And on the other side, we branch off to get a different branch where we go, where we also get wings, but in that case, we keep the long body and the whiskery face. So that's kind of a fun thing that you can try at home in learning about animal taxonomies. And I wanna give you all some ideas that you can use for doing that at home. So here's a list of different taxonomy ideas you can create at home. If you have Pokemon cards, you might have a lot different creatures on them. So that's kind of fun because you can right away move them in groups. You can also do this with Harry Potter animals or mythical creatures. You can do it with Halloween creatures like ghosts, vampires, Frankenstein, or maybe different kinds of Halloween costumes you see online. You can use whatever stuffed or plastic animals you have at home. You can actually use the dragons on how to train your dragon if that's a show that you like. And it helps because they actually have them classified in some different groups in the show as well. You can use different kinds of fairies from around the world. You can use different kinds of aliens too, especially if you have some alien toys or you can get some pictures of aliens. You can actually do it with teddy bears, although you'll have to get a little finer on the types of details you pay attention to. Or you can do it with Mario characters. And that's kind of fun because you'll see you've got a turtle group and you've got more human groups. So it can be a lot of fun to look at what kinds of creatures are, are connected and how they might be connected. All right, chime in at home with your own ideas and your own taxonomies and any questions you have. Remember to check out our book, 
200 plus ways to explore nature in your home or backyard and to join us next Wednesday at 11 for our next virtual class or tour. And also check out, coming up, we will have our first virtual preschool class with a fun craft you can try for preschoolers at home and a preschool story. So be on the lookout for that too. All right, thanks, bye.